This person started his day with a bottle of champagne worth thousands of dollars and consumed a crazy amount of prohibited medical drugs. Afterward, he engaged in stock market manipulations that even FBI agents found hair-raising. He gained worldwide fame after the release of the sensational 2013 movie, The Wolf of Wall Street. In this film, Scorsese and DiCaprio were able to authentically portray the insane lifestyle of Jordan Belfort and capture the spirit of that time. However, the movie hardly touched on the actual manipulations carried out by Jordan, which ultimately led to his incarceration. In this video, I won't retell the moments of Belfort's life that are already well depicted in the movie. Instead, I will focus on what was not shown in the film or was shown inaccurately. I will also explain in simple terms what these aggressive sales tactics were that eventually got Leonardo DiCaprio's character in trouble. The Wolf of Wall Street movie begins with the future wolf landing a job at a brokerage firm on Wall Street at the age of 22. In reality, Belfort entered the world of investments at the age of 25, and before that, he had already lived what he described as a dog's life, in which a year felt like seven. Belfort initially pursued a degree in dentistry, but he dropped out after the dean told him that the golden age of dentistry had passed, and the profession rarely made anyone wealthy, except for ensuring a comfortable life. An interesting fact in Belfort's biography is that before his business education, he sold ice cream and seashell necklaces on the beach at the age of 17. According to Jordan, at such a young age, he was making around $1.500 a day, allowing him to quickly save $20,000 for his education. However, the only evidence of such exceptional young entrepreneurial talent is Jordan Belfort's word. After dropping out of college, Belfort was determined to succeed in life. Initially, he worked for a major meat company, learning where to source products and how to organize logistics. In short, the future wolf understood the entire operation and decided to start his own business selling meat and seafood. He invested a lot of money and embarked on an aggressive market takeover, from private clients and restaurants to other establishments in need of fresh meat. However, this time, he couldn't replicate the success he had with seashells. Money was tight, the products were spoiling, and a constant cash flow gap became the norm for the company. 99% of people in such a situation would simply close their business. But Belfort was not one to back down. He persuaded suppliers to provide credit and rented 26 trucks for an even more aggressive market takeover. After all these operations, the company ended up in even greater losses. But Belfort's nerves were like steel cables, and he wasn't particularly worried about it. Meat suppliers waited for payment at the end of the month, while Jordan received money from sales every day. In simple terms, Belfort obtained an interest-free loan from suppliers in the form of goods, and then told these same suppliers that they could only get their money back if they continued to deliver goods on time. Otherwise, both Belfort's company and the suppliers would drown. Of course, this couldn't go on for long, and the company eventually went bankrupt. Whether Jordan pulled anyone else along with his suppliers, the story doesn't reveal. Belfort decided to turn over a not-so-pretty page of his biography and declared bankruptcy. Afterward, he joined the brokerage firm L.F. Rothschild. By the way, this company has no relation to the Rothschild clan, and it was founded by their namesake H.V. One. Ironically, in 1899, shortly after Belfort joined the company, it closed its doors, just missing its anniversary. As strange as the first day of work portrayed in the movie may seem, in reality, it was much the same. His supervisor, with great contempt, began explaining the new employee's duties, which included making calls to potential clients and transferring the call to his boss. However, the most successful broker in the company, Mark Hanna, soon approached them to personally speak with the newcomer, who had managed to sell a few shares during the interview. Belfort immediately appealed to Mark, and he took the young star out for lunch at a luxurious restaurant. When Belfort ordered water instead of alcohol at the restaurant, Hannah and the waiter looked at him as if Jordan had confessed to some kind of perversion. After that, Hannah indulged in a white substance and revealed the real secrets of their challenging job to Belfort. As Jordan himself would later recount, this conversation completely transformed his lifestyle leading him to indulge in vices such as prostitutes and heavy drugs every day. Jordan became part of a lively group and quickly obtained a brokerage license. 
His first official day as a full-fledged broker coincided with Black Monday. After L.F. Rothschild closed down, Belfort had to switch several companies. Jordan circulated among relatively respectable companies for a long time and worked within the bounds of the law, so to speak, until he joined the shady investment firm depicted in the film, Investors Center. In his book, Belfort extensively discusses his extravagant parties and talks about giving his brokers a chance to make money while giving minimal attention to how he actually made money himself. In the book, he modestly refers to his earnings method as pump and dump. In the movie, it's even more modestly called aggressive sales. However, labeling what Belfort was doing as aggressive sales is like calling blatant embezzlement from the treasury or inefficient budget allocation nonchalant. What Belfort was engaged in was a gross violation of trading rules. The companies offered to clients over the phone were penny stocks, with prices as low as a couple of dollars per share. At the time, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission didn't have strong oversight of this market, so the boiler room owners conspired with the owners of these cheap companies and bought up almost all of their shares at a low price. They would then instruct their brokers to sell these shares to clients over the phone, making up various falsehoods, such as, since most of the company's shares were owned by the boiler room owner, there were very few of these shares in circulation, causing the price to skyrocket instantly. Afterward, the boiler room owner would unload all his shares of the worthless company, making substantial profits. When all the positions were sold off, the boiler room brokers would switch to a new company. Since demand for the old company was primarily created by the boiler room itself, the stock prices would instantly plummet by a hundredfold, leaving unfortunate investors with massive losses. Naturally, the owner of the boiler room didn't register these shares under his own name, but used frontmen, whom Leonardo DiCaprio's character humbly refers to in the movie as Merzilka. This type of boiler room was exactly what Investors Center, where Belfort ended up as a broker, was. The fact that they earned hefty commissions was the least of their violations. This shady operation was almost immediately shut down after Jordan joined it. But Belfort liked the scheme so much that the future Wolf of Wall Street decided to replicate it, not as an ordinary broker, but as the owner of a boiler room. Together with Danny Porush, he founded the company Stratton Oakmont. Initially, Belfort recruited staff from former employees of his previous meat company. Although the movie didn't mention a word about his meat company, they did include a reference. As the company began to expand, Jordan added former brokers from L.F. Rothschild to his staff. This amusing detail wasn't mentioned in the movie, but even Mark Hanna would later switch to work at Stratton. In the beginning, Belfort and his gang of brokers traded according to the classic boiler room scheme, step one, acquire a cheap company under front men, step two, pump up the stock price on the stock exchange with the boiler room brokers, step three, quickly dump all the shares, and so on endlessly. Then Belfort decided to enhance the scheme by inventing the so-called Kodak sales system to sell stocks not only to the poor, but also to the wealthy. Through trial and error, Belfort found that if you offer cheap stocks directly to a wealthy person, they would often just hang up. But if you first entice them with shares of a reliable company as bait, such as Kodak, for example, then after the victim takes the bait, you can sell them anything. Soon, regulatory authorities took notice of Belfort's company, and he had to strike a deal, paying a small fine considering his turnovers. However, why all the other fraudsters were immediately jailed, while Jordan managed to grease the wheels of justice and negotiate with the SEC and DOJ, remaining free, remains uncertain. In his book, Belfort describes in detail his interactions with a certain Richard Bowe, who was closely connected to the top of the New York Mafia and had a reputation for being able to resolve almost any issue. Apparently, it was this beau who helped negotiate with the authorities, resulting in a paltry multi-million dollar fine for Belfort's companies. Another intriguing aspect not shown in the film is how, by some mysterious means, Belfort managed to bug the offices of several FBI agents, allowing him to know the enemy's intentions in advance. In his book, Belfort claims that the enigmatic Mr. Bo had no involvement in the bug installation operation. Moreover, he even discouraged it. The incorruptible FBI agent depicted in the movie did exist in real life. According to the mysterious Bo, 
This honest agent envied Jordan because he earned more in an hour than the FBI agent did in a year. Everyone who knew Belfort personally during that time described him not only as a top-notch salesman, but also as someone who charged everyone around him with energy. In fact, even today in all his public appearances after serving his time, Belfort continues to make the same impression. Despite his immoral lifestyle, Belfort was not greedy. He tipped generously to the service staff and the women who attended to him. The employees in his company genuinely had the chance to earn enormous sums of money if they performed well. For example, a former carpet salesman who joined Stratton Oakmont managed to earn $100,000 in the first month of diligent work and a million dollars in the first year. To boost morale, Belfort held morning meetings since even the most brilliant brokers, who earned hefty commissions from their deals, would occasionally question the ethics of convincing people to make unprofitable purchases. The morning meetings helped soothe the consciences of the employees and set them in the right mindset. All the crazy antics shown in the movie, according to Belfort, did not match reality. In numerous interviews, Belfort mentioned that, in reality, things were even more outrageous than what was portrayed on the screen. For instance, his time spent in Vegas was the subject of several chapters in his book, whereas the movie gave it relatively little screen time. The only restraining factor in all this madness was Jordan's father, who truly earned the nickname Mad Max. In addition to handling the accounting, he acted as a sort of supervisor. It was Max Belford who played a significant role in helping Stratton Oakmont stay afloat for so long. In 1993, Belford firmly believed in his impunity and decided it was time to move to the next level. He orchestrated the infamous IPO of the shoe company Steve Madden Shoes. Watching the movie might give the impression that Steve Madden's company was genuinely top-notch, and Steve Madden himself was a recognized fashion genius. In reality, at the time of the IPO, Steve Madden's company had just one store, which was roughly equivalent to taking a basement workshop public on the level of Microsoft and Apple. Yes, the business was real, and it did make some money, but the scale was not nearly enough to go public on NASDAQ. In preparation for this scam, Jordan preemptively bought almost the entire Steve Madden company for $500,000. By law, Jordan was not allowed to own such a large percentage of the company he was taking public, so he used a tried-and-true scheme involving a frontman. In this case, the so-called Merzilka, he represented himself as Stephen Madden. The Steve Madden shown in the movie as a genius who created new trends was actually just a nominal director. The shoe company was supposed to be another boiler room that they would inflate and then dump at its peak. However, Belfort attracted the attention of the incorruptible FBI, and Jordan decided to sell his stake in Stratton Oakmont and hand over the reins of the brokerage firm to his partner, Danny Porush. Jordan couldn't sit idle. Besides, he had pumped Steve Madden's company with so much money for the IPO and created such a buzz around it that it seemed a waste to just dump it. Plus, since he already had a controlling stake in the company, Belfort decided to get into the shoe business. Under Jordan's leadership, the shoe company quickly took off. He swiftly opened 18 retail stores, and the company reached $45 million in revenue. After such success, Steve Madden was no longer content with his role as a nominal director. Belfort and Madden began to fight for control of the shoe company. However, after Jordan left Stratton Oakmont, he had very few levers of pressure on Steve Madden. Jordan left Danny in charge of the brokerage firm, and Danny, with his responsibilities, performed abysmally. In his book, Jordan extensively describes how poorly the morning meetings went under Danny's leadership. Instead of boosting the company's morale, Danny attempted to identify which of the brokers had non-traditional sexual orientations. Additionally, government authorities were putting intense pressure on the company, leading to the closure of Stratton Oakmont in 1996. This closure further complicated Jordan's relationship with Madden. Up until then, Jordan could influence his partner by artificially supporting the stock price of Steve Madden shoes through Stratton Oakmont. But now, this lever was gone, and the business empire gradually began to crumble. The only thing that remained unchanged was Belfort's lifestyle. He continued to abuse prescription drugs and illegal substances, resulting in many high-profile incidents, which were accurately portrayed in the movie. 
These incidents included a car accident while driving a sports car and the flooding of a yacht. Jordan's family life also began to experience problems. His wife grew tired of Belfort's drunken antics. Several times, Jordan ended up in the police station due to altercations with his spouse, and eventually, he agreed to undergo rehabilitation. After completing the rehabilitation program, Jordan seemed to be on the path to recovery. However, in 1998, FBI agents showed up at his home and arrested him on charges of fraud and money laundering. Apparently, during his rehabilitation, Jordan stopped cooperating with the authorities in the way they expected, and new circumstances unexpectedly came to light. Jordan faced a potential 30-year prison sentence, so to reduce his sentence, he agreed to cooperate, implicating almost all of his partners. Jordan spent only 22 months in prison, although calling it a prison is a stretch. The correctional facility had a large library with a comfortable reading room and even a tennis court. It was there that Belfort met actor Tommy Chong, who gave him the idea to write two autobiographical books, The Wolf of Wall Street and Catching the Wolf of Wall Street. These books served as the basis for the movie of the same name. Currently, Belfort is a sought-after speaker, and according to his own words, he earns even more today than he did during his stock market schemes. However, he has not fully paid the $110 million that the court ordered him to pay to all the victims of his schemes. This video was prepared by The Hustler Channel. Subscribe to the channel. See you next time.